Um, so the second half uh, is going to start now. We have, um, shh, please, please uh, try to behave nicely. Uh, we, the second half, we have uh, Effie Ben Melech, who's from, well, how should I say, from Northwestern University, but he's also a regular visitor here. He comes twice a year, he teaches classes and so on. And then Eugene, at the, the other end of the, also visits occasionally. <laughs> Some of us had hopes he would visit more often, but it doesn't look like it's going to be. <laughs> and Asaf Hamdani, and each one is going to have, Asaf Hamdani, sorry, from the law school here. And each one is going to have uh, about 20 minutes and then a few questions to either the post-break panelists or to the speakers from the, before the break, if you can manage to remember what they all said. And the first one is Effie Ben Melech on securitization, a very timely topic. Some, yes. Thank you very much. So our panel is going to be about securitization, and most importantly about some thoughts about implementation of uh, securitization in Israel. What I chose to do was to give you some background about the economic motives for securitization, uh, perhaps to talk a little bit about the economic rationale of securitization. Do we actually need it? Maybe it's just a byproduct of uh, regulation. And then try to think about, see some facts from the crisis in the US. What have we learned about securitization? and some concluding thoughts about, uh, about Israel, for Israel. So again, uh, what is securitization? Why securitization? I'm going to show you some structured, f uh, some facts about the structured finance crisis, structured finance just uh, another way for securitization. I'm going to ask whether securitization indeed had some adverse consequences. Did it lead to risky lending? And, and the answer is yes. And then some lessons from the US and from Europe uh, for Israel. So what is securitization? Securitization involves two processes. It involves the pooling of assets, and it involves the tranching of the pool. Uh, you see a picture over there, and on the left, the gray uh, shape, is basically a pool of assets. And these assets are basically loans. They can be mortgages, they can be bonds, they can be airplanes, if this is going to be secured by airplanes. Um, you see the note over there that these are below investment grade assets, and that's key. You cannot do securitization with safe assets. The whole idea of securitization is the alchemy, whether we believe it or not. You need to be able to transform junk into gold. Not a problem to transform gold into gold. You have to do it with junk. So if anyone has a thought that you will do securitization with safe assets, that's not going to happen. Pulling of assets, pulling of risky assets, and then eventually transforming them to the shape that you see on the right. The pulling takes place in the left side, and the tranching takes place in the right side. You buy the assets on the left side, and on the right side, what you do is you issue securities against these assets. They are, these are all claims against the assets. They are tranched, which means that these are different bonds with different um, seniority. The AAA would be the most senior ones. And then there is a double A or an A, and eventually there, was, there is what we call an equity tranche. Another way to look into securitization, this is just a balance sheet. On the left, you have assets, and on the right, you have liabilities. And in the middle, you have someone who is making a profit. That's the SPV, that's the sieve. Uh, these, are the agent, the, these are the economic players that are trying to benefit from that. In many ways, securitization is an arbitrage. It's an attempt to buy assets that pay high rates, high interest rates, and sell assets that on average pay lower interest rates. The spread has been kept by the, by the sieve or by the SPV. So some facts about the securitization market. By December 08, it is basically the largest sub-market of fixed income in the US. It's about a third, more than a third of the US bond market, $11 trillion. The overwhelming majority of structured finance tranches were rated by rating agencies. You know, we had some question before about rating ag agencies, and I will address, address the failure of the rating agencies in rating these securities and what we can learn from that. The lion's share of these securities that were rated were originally rated as AAA, which is the highest rating that is only reserved to assets that are very safe. And it's very important because that credit rating serves as a focal point for structured finance issuers and investors. They rely on credit rating very much. 
Uh, at the extreme cases, they don't even collect any other information. Credit ratings are going to be at the center of any market for structured uh, finance, and this is why we have to play, uh, uh, pay a lot of attention to them. Many investors in this market are rating captured. What do I mean by that? They rely, they are obsessed with credit rating. There are many attempts to try to regulate now the rating agencies in order to make sure that they are protected. And I will have some thoughts about this as well. So why securitization? Why do we need this market? First, just you know, to make sure that we understand this is not a new invention. The first real securitization structure in the US goes back to 1857. The market takes off in the 1980s, and it really takes off in the late 1990s. But we have a history of 30 years of securitization with no crisis attached to it. So like everything else, everything in moderation, and some securitization with some level of leverage is actually not a bad idea. The problem wasn't with securitization. The problem was with the uh, dose of securitization. I, I, and I'm going to show some of this uh, later on. So when economists try to think, why do we need a market for securitization, we have some thoughts. The first one is risk sharing. We have a bank. The bank feels that it has too many risky assets on its balance sheet, so it wants, it wants to sell it off. Okay? He wants to share the risk with someone else who maybe is more capable of dealing with the risk, maybe less fragile than a bank. The second one, it's a more theoretically idea of market incompleteness. Maybe we would like to complete the market by creating enough assets that will correspond to many different situations. The third one is about liquidity. What we, de what we do in, in, uh, in asset-backed securities and securitization is we are trying to take assets that are not very liquid, like mortgages, like loans, and they are not very uh, liquid because they are very risky. And by putting them to together, we are creating some liquidity, which is driven by the fact that there is no need to be obsessed with information as much as we usually do. And that's going to be a very important rationale for that. The last one is basically basic saying that there are some clients. There is a clientele effect, and some investors really want to invest in structured finance, perhaps because they need highly rated assets, and securitization is the main supplier, or used to be the main supplier, of very highly rated assets. Okay, so if you want to work in securitization, you need to like uh, acronyms, you need to like Rachet to vote. And what you see here are the different types of the, the glossary or the different types of uh, uh, securities that you can see. You have ABS, which stands for asset-backed securities. Then you have MBS for mortgage-backed securities. Some of them would be RMBS for residential mortgage-backed securities. Some of them would be CMBS for commercial mortgage-backed securities. Some of them would be HELS for home equity loans, which are very risky RMBSs. Uh, then you have CDOs, that stand for collateralized debt obligations, which are basically pools of RMBSs with some HELS. And then you have CBOs that do not exist anymore for collateralized bond obligations, CLO for collateralized loan obligation. And the worst of the worst, ABS CDOs, this is where the crisis happened. These are CDOs that are secured by CDOs, that are secured by CDOs, that are secured by RMBSs, that are secured by mortgages. And those are the ones that we are going to look more carefully into and what exactly happened to them. So um, some facts about uh, uh, structured finance. From June 07, the credit worthiness of structured finance products has deteriorated rapidly. The number of downgrades in November 07 alone exceeded 2,000, with 500 tranches downgraded more than 10 notches at a time. That's an extreme move. Usually when you have a credit action, you know, you would be downgraded from a double A to double A minus. Here we see something that goes all the way from triple A to maybe triple B in one action, and that's very rare. Okay? Um, during the first nine months of 08, about 30,000 securities were downgraded. Some were downgraded within the month more than once, and more than 11,000 of the downgrades affected securities that were rated AAA. So let's see how it looks uh, graphically. Uh, this is based on some work that I have done with Jennifer Lugos. Jennifer Lugos uh, was my student, then became the Fed expert for uh, CDOs, and then she moved to uh, Washington University. What you see here, and uh, this is actually an, an interesting story because that she came to me maybe in 06 or in 07, and she wanted to work on CDOs, and I, I asked, you know, why do you want to do that? We, no one knew what CDOs were, but she insisted, and eventually that was a good market to study. What you, look, what you see here are two lines. There is the one that is solid and goes all the way up, and there is the one that is broken and uh, seems to be way below. 
every year we take all of the rating actions for structured finance products and we count them. And the broken line is the number of upgrades and the solid line is the number of downgrades. And you see that they roughly move the same way until 07, when the number of upgrades drops slightly and the number of downgrades goes through the roof to about uh, um, 30,000 and, and, and even 40,000 down, downgrades. That's one aspect of the crisis. Another aspect of the crisis, you again see here two lines. You still see the solid line that goes up rapidly. You can read it from the left vertical axis, from the left y-axis. That's the number of, the, uh, the number of downgrades. Uh, the other plot that you see, the other line which is broken, which you read from the right axis, shows you how severe was the average downgrade. And you can see that on average, this rating moved by two or three notches, and by the, by in, during the crisis, they go down all the way to about five or six notches at a time. An average downgrade involves a very severe downgrade during the crisis. Now, the third slide that shows you what happened in the crisis is this one. Again, the same plot that you have seen before, the line that goes up, the number of downgrades, now is a bar plot. And uh, the darker shade shows you how many of the securities that were downgraded began as AAA at, at that point, which is, again, a very high fraction. And in the paper, we show that this is something that we have never seen before, not in the single name market, not in the corporate bond market. It was definitely a failure of the rating agencies. So to give you another sense of how severe or what was the role of structured finance, what role did structured finance play in the crisis, what you see here are the total losses or the total write-downs in the entire global financial system at the darkest point in the crisis, which is late 08, early 09. And you can see at the bottom right square that it amounted to about half a trillion dollars. I think that there is a typo in the title. It should be in millions. You know? So this is half a trillion dollars of write-downs. Now, you can see that about 40% of that, that's the second column that, that says ABS CDOs, about $218 billion of write-downs were only due to ABS CDOs. This is not due to some traditional structured finance, due to this specific type of structured finance, which are CDOs, 40%. Another uh, $84 billion is due to RMBS. That's the fourth uh, column from the left. Okay, so if you sum the two, you can explain um, more than $300 billion of write-down from, from, from exposure that was driven from direct exposure to the structured finance to, to the outcome of securitization. Uh, look in contrast, corporate credit, exposure to firms in the crisis, write-downs is about $50 billion. We tend to think about banks as providing um, credit for firms. One of the things that we have discovered in the crisis is that that role has been significantly reduced, and mostly what they have, uh, have been doing was to uh, provide, of course, credit to households and to hold a lot of the structured finance the way that they uh, securitize these assets. So again, ABS CDOs and in general securitization, but ABS CDOs in particular played a major role in the crisis. So then the question is, uh, did securitization lead to risky lending? Did it change the incentives? And you know, Amit, Professor Cero, from the University of Chicago have shown you some evidence related to that, and I'm presenting you an evidence that he has written in another paper, uh, a very famous paper, and the answer is yes, it did. And the way that uh, they show that, you know, the question is, did securitization in non-agency market lead to lax screening by lenders? The answer is yes, exactly the example that uh, Professor Cero was using, which is basically, um, I'm less likely to collect information about the borrower if I know that eventually I can sell if I know that eventually I can sell the loan, yes. On the previous uh, slide, you did have overlap in there. You said that ABSs are based on CDOs, that maybe some CDOs were downgraded, and then as a result, the ABS CDO was downgraded. No, so this is this you is. Might have, you might have overlap. In there. I don't have overlap in there. This is basically this is a pure <laughs> definition. There is no overlap in between the categories. What you see there is the pure, um, the, the the pure exposure for the holders of this that nets, nets the effect between RMBSs and, uh, and ABS CDOs. It's exactly the pure effect of those. There is no overlap. Um, so what do we see? Um, what, 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 uh, what do they find? They find that loans, were more like th loans that were more likely to be securitized 
that actually did uh, uh, were securitized, um, defaulted 20% more than, sim than similar risk profile loans with lower likelihood of securitization. Um, the idea here is that, um, again, there is not enough screening if you know that eventually you can sell the loans. You know, it's very tempting to basically uh, say that, you know, there is no need for securitization. Why do we need it? Uh, it was uh, at the center of the crisis. It's not clear that uh, uh, it's, it's going to make lending more efficient. Very tempting to say that securitization uh, um, is something that we should stay away from. Let's talk a little bit more about the problem that we have with securitization. What you see here is the process that, uh, that uh, Professor Seru has shown you before. Uh, the lender is the bank, and the bank is lending to the homeowner. There is a mortgage, and then the lender, the bank, is selling the mortgage to the SPV, and the SPV uh, is issuing tranches that eventually are being sold to investors. We have two problems here, and you know, I, I would like to weave in into the discussion some of the lessons for, I for Israel. There is the problem with moral hazard, and there is the problem with adverse selection. Let's start with the problem of moral hazard. At the lending point, the homeowner is getting money from the lender, and this is the process of mortgage origination. The question is, how do, I, how do you avoid what you know, the authors have, have found? And what you have to, to make sure that you maintain high standards in loan origination. Uh, that, this sounds easy, but actually in some research that I've done with, uh, with <coughs> Professor Cerro, most of the reasons that banks have lent to risky borrowers were not driven by the fact that they did the wrong thing. They were actually forced by the government to do it. So you really have to be worried about government policies or subsidies that eventually lead the banks to take more risk because they, they, they feel that this is what the government, uh, this is exactly what the government objective is. The second one, and this is a tool that is now being used a lot by the Fed, is the mortgage putbacks, which is a very simple, sim, sim, simple tool that can be used in order to avoid the moral hazard problem in securitization. It means that there is a recourse. At the extreme case, here is, a, here is a mortgage that has been originated. It has defaulted. Take it back. I, I return you the mortgage, and you have to pay me, again, uh, the amount that I've paid for the mortgage, maybe accounting for the interest, uh, interest payment that, that I have uh, collected in the, uh, in the meantime. Now, this is an extreme case, and the way to make it work, and that's the way that it's being done in the US, maybe we should expect that three mortgages out of 100 should default. So if only two mortgages have defaulted, I have no recourse. But if five had, then five over three, two, I can return to you. That's a way to deter the moral hazard with a putback. Of course, it can be abused, but you have to find a mechanism that is based on that, and I think that that's an important lesson that is now being implemented in the US, and it's, it's, it's a good lesson for Israel. The second one is the other side. Once the mortgages have been purchased by the SBV, how do you basically may, uh, uh, resolve the issue of adverse selection? Um, so how do you do pooling? The first issue is how do you, you actually do diversification in Israel? The idea in the US was that you, know, you have mortgages in Texas, you have mortgages in New York, and generally they're not going to be correlated. Of, of course, in the crisis, everything was correlated. But outside of the crisis, how do you, avoid, how do, you do it in Israel? You have mortgages in Petr Tikva, you have mortgages in Ramat Khan. They are very likely to be correlated. You have to think about a diversification, a diversification model that would account for the fact that that's, this is a small country. Now, other small countries, did find a way to securitize, but you want to make sure that you have a model that is robust to this issue. <coughs> Second issue is that a large amount of the mortgages are already on the balance sheet of the banks, and the concern is that they will try to sell bad mortgages to the institutions. What's the issue here? If you look into the life cycle of a mortgage in the US, the first three months, there's no default. And then the likelihood of default is increasing up to, it peaks around two years, because some, someone wasn't able to calibrate very well the payment, and then it goes down. If someone sells you a mortgage within four or five months, there is very, it's very unlikely that they know something about a mortgage. The lemons problem, the adverse selection problem, is not very big. If someone sells you a mortgage after four years, there's probably a reason for that. He wants to sell the mortgage. You don't, so, so you, have to find a prob, you have to find a solution for that. Balance sheet of banks in, in, in Israel now are full of mortgages that, that were originated during the, um, the, the housing boom, or the housing bubble, depends how, how you want to call it. 
not very clear how you can offload them to other institution, you have to find a mechanism that would um, um, solve the adverse selection problem. Crunching, limit leverage in the transaction. That would be my recommendation. You want to limit the amount that is AAA relative to debt, that is super senior. You don't want to pretend that some, something is safer than the other. But you also want to limit the amount of debt that you have relative to equity overall. You want to have some equity. I would actually recommend to enforce larger equity stakes for a very simple reason. When you have an institutional investor that buys a tranche that is debt, they buy and hold it. They never generate any more information. You can say that the debt is a slip. You want to have some equity there that will be floating around and will generate information. And that will give you information about the trust. Some people talk about skin in the game. They want the originator or the issuer to hold the equity so it can suffer if something goes wrong. I don't like this idea for two reasons. The first one is if the originator is going to hold, forced to hold the equity stake, there'll be no trading, there'll be no information. The second one is that usually the originator is, al is allowed to reshuffle about 10% of the pool, replace the loans. Now going back to what Prof Professor Peltzman said, imagine that I'm underwater, the equity has no value. And now I have skin in the game, what, do, what, what exactly do you do? You give me incentives to buy even riskier loans. Equity is important. But having skin in the game can be a double-edged sword. <coughs> what else should we learn from the US? Here's the cycle of CDO issuances. It goes up, it goes down. Now it goes up a little bit more, mostly in Europe. There is some delay in, 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 in realizing exactly what happened in the crisis. It's a very simple policy rule. Avoid CDOs. Don't go into CDOs. It's enough to be in first generation or first tier securitization. One doesn't need to jump into resecuritization of RMBSs. Pay attention to the financing of structured products. In particular, avoid excessive reliance on short-term debt financing. That's another lesson that we have. Make sure that you do not create a too large shadow bank system. You want to create a market for securitization. Very likely that those who would buy and those who would issue would be unregulated entities. That's the shadow banking system. The vast majority of the shadow banking system in the US had to do with, structured, with, with the ABS market, with the structured finance market. You want to be careful about that. And think very carefully about credit rating. And here I might be a little bit more controversial. And these are the, the next few slides. So now here is a quote by, uh, by Alan Blinder during the crisis uh, in 07. And he's basically accusing, uh, so to speak, he's not the only one, the credit rating for the failure. And he's right, even though he doesn't want to take them for public whipping, which they have uh, been taken to. But the question is, you know, what is the right way to think about the role that credit rating play in, uh, in uh, structured finance markets? So people are now criticizing the rating agencies for several reasons. There is the C issue, which, you know, you, you pay to be rated. And that's not a problem in my, in my idea. It worked very well for about 30 or 40 years, didn't generate too many biases. I don't think that this is the first issue problem. The second is barriers to entry. There are very few of them. Well, if anything, you know, we would like to look, we would like to look into data. There is a recent study that shows that when you introduce competition in rating agencies, it becomes even worse. So I'm not sure that I agree to that. The third one is rating shopping. The, the notion that I can go to the rating and force them to give me high rating. And that's, there, is, there is evidence for that. You know, some of it is coming from my paper. Uh, but maybe it can explain 5% of the crisis. That's not the core of the crisis. The core of the crisis is very different. The core of the crisis is that they all relied on black boxes, on formulas that haven't been tested before. Rating agencies were not malicious, as much as we would like to say it, as, as much as we would like to describe them. They just relied on a formula that was untested. And there was something even worse than that, than that which is the rating agency as an architect. The rating agencies taught the in issuers, basically, how to issue securities that will be AAA. So here's how they did it. Let's say that the year is 06 or 07 and you wanted to issue a CDO, a hedge fund in, in Connecticut, you would, send the, you would contact the credit rating agency and they would send you the model. What is the model? It's an Excel spreadsheet with many modules into it in Visual Basic. And you would link into it your assets. And the model spits out the suggested structure 
for the, uh, for the issue. And I, I, I like to use it because I, I would like you to look into the, into the bottom box there, which is um, excess collateral. Here's what it says, if you read it, it basically says that the model tells you that you have too much collateral for a AAA, and it will tell you exactly how much you can shave off the pool and still get AAA. Take off 10, 15 percent, you'll get AAA. Now, people have been accusing the rating agencies for basically cooking the books, and, you know, the, uh, of, of cook, cooking the model. And of course, the answer was always, it's about transparency. You know, when I teach my students, I tell them that's going to be 30 percent the midterm and 40 percent the, the final and maybe 30 percent for class participation. I tell them how I will rate them and they do the same. Not very easy to, uh, to accuse the rating agencies. But for everyone who is calling for transparency of the rating model, and that's one of the recommendations that I've seen in, in the Bank of Israel report for securitization, I don't think that this is a, a good idea. I'm very happy with the, rating, with the rating models being very opaque, not having enough information, instead of basically making sure that everyone knows exactly how I model it. I mean, here is my view of the, of the credit rating crisis. They had the wrong formula. They gave the formula to everyone, and they've mistakenly rated $11 trillion. That was the crisis. It was a mistake. But the mistake has been compounded over $11 trillion because that everyone knew the formula. So transparency, I'm not sure that that's a good idea in that case. How to deal with the credit rating agencies in Israel? Page 41 of the Bank of Israel report, which I've read, which is an excellent report, um, for the most part, there is a call for more transparency in the rating model. And I strongly disagree. I think that it will generate uh, competition to the bottom. I also disagree with the need for further regulation of rating agencies, which is now you, go and re you, you re regulate how, how you do it. I objected based on almost an ideological reason. The most important clients of the rating agencies are the governments. So it, it would be very weird for the government to tell the rating how to rate others when the, the biggest client is the government. That's only one problem. The second problem is that the government doesn't have the expertise and will never have the expertise on how to design the proper rating agencies because of the people who have ex expertise in that typically do not work for the government. I don't think that, there is a good, that it's a good idea to, uh, to regulate credit ratings um, in general. But the main issue is rating dependence. Many investors are rating dependent. Rating-based regulation, commercial banks, money market funds, based in the US insurance companies, they all rely on rating. And they rely on rating because of the that they are very simple. And they rely on rating because of the regulators like credit ratings. Regulators are looking for benchmarks to evaluate the institution under their jurisdiction. What is, what is uh, uh, easier than just base it on, on uh, rating? Also, many internal rating that are uh, many internal uh, rating that are uh, that investment are based on investors that are subject to rating-based regulation and will try to exploit credit rating arbitrage. Here is an example for credit rating arbitrage. Look into the volume of the CDOs. Two types of CDOs: those that are being done for fundamental reasons. That's the blue one. These are the banks that are trying to offload some securities. Those that are being done for arbitrage because that I can issue AAA that everyone likes, and hence I will have to pay very low interest rate on that, and I use very risky assets for that. That's the red area. This is a market that is driven by arbitrage of rating. The solution is not to regulate the rating agencies. The solution is to remove the regulation that creates this dependency. Um, but, you know, despite everything that I said about uh, securitization, securitization is not dead in the U.S. You see the red pattern there. This is issuance of mortgage backed securities by the, by the private market, and that's dead in the U.S. But the government has been very active, and that's the blue line. Actually, the, go the government is trying to pick up uh, Freddie and Fannie, the securitization need or demand that is not being fulfilled by the market. The last part is the fact that securitization is not only about mortgages. And actually in the US there are very active markets that did dip in the crisis, as you can see, but they fully recovered, that make sure that students can get loans and people who buy automobiles can get loans and firms can buy equipment. So you have, you have asset-backed securities that are secured by tractors for those who buy tractors and you have asset-backed securities that are secured by airplanes for, um, for many airlines in the US. 
This, here there is a real need for credit. It makes credit more available. It lowers the cost of credit. And when we think about securitization, this is actually a market that is less prone to over-leverage. It's less prone to speculation. That's a market that we would like to have. We also want to have a market for mortgages, but we want to make sure that we have enough restrictions on leverage and make sure that we are not going to deal too much, we are not going to solve the problem by imposing new regulation on the rating agencies, <coughs> where to some extent the credit rating are the problem to begin with. I'd be very happy with having regulation that is free of credit rating that would force investors to actually search for information, to actually do their homework. What credit rating do is it economizes on collection of information. I don't mind ha having duplication of information acquisition. I'm not going to outlaw credit rating. You know, they have the freedom to do whatever they do but we cannot make the market dependent on credit rating by, by, by enforcing more and more regulation uh, and making more and more investors being rating dependent. So I think that the bottom line is that there is room for securitization. One is to think about the incentives that they create. There are solutions for that. Some markets are less speculative than, than others, and you want to get rid of the most speculative markets, mostly the CDOs and the re-securitization. You want to think about restriction of leverage. Some of the prescribed ideas that we see in the US, like skin in the game, I'm not sure that they're exactly a good idea. You have to think about it more deeply, and you have to think about the crucial role that rating agencies play there, and it's not clear that regulating the rating agencies would make the problem disappear. Okay. So, you know, there's a reason that Ishai keeps forgetting what I'm doing, what, you know, what's my affiliation, because I'm the only lawyer on the panel. And, you know, that creates two types of issues. First, is like, you know, first I wanted to do is just, you know, go through the 2,000 pages of the Dodd-Frank Act and, you know, explain them to you in detail. But Ishai didn't provide me with enough time. The second problem is that I was asked to talk about regulation in Israel, and it's always difficult to talk about regulation in Israel in English. Um, and, and nevertheless, when we decided to focus this panel on regulation, each one of us uh, took a different angle. I'm going to talk about, uh, not really about securitization, but securitization in Israel, or the proposals for securitization in Israel, as a case study on our love-hate relationship with institutional uh, investors. Okay. So, uh, uh, this is why I never use Windows 8. Uh, it's like a discrimination against the law school. It works perfectly. I knew, I knew that, you know, I knew that that's going to be a discrimination against the law school. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a little, bit of, a little bit of background about pension reforms in Israel and the increasing reliance on institutional investors, and then provide some examples of the pervasive distrust of institutional investors' uh, capacity to make certain investments under Israeli regulation, try to provide some uh, less convincing and perhaps some more convincing explanations, and some ideas about going forward specifically what I'll try to argue is that uh, Israeli regulators need to abandon their attempts to regulate, to regulate uh, institutional in investors' investment by product type and instead focus on structural reforms. So uh, pension reforms in Israel, like in many other countries uh, around the world, uh, consist roughly uh, of two major elements. The first one is privatization. That is taking the government away from the business of security, securing uh, future retirees' pension benefits. And the second, the second element of pension reform is uh, the second element of pension reform is a shift from uh, defined contribution to defined defined benefit. Excuse me to defined uh, contribution. Um, and generally speaking, the pension system in Israel, uh, and this is where the slides would be uh, quite handy, but the pension system in Israel, you can describe it from through three different angles. From the savers' perspective, we have mandatory uh, deposits. Uh, nobody really asks me how much money I want to deposit into my pension account. I get some tax benefits. 
Unlike the part of my pension that's still invested in a 401k account in the US, I have no ability, I have no ability to run my own investments and I must buy a post-retirement annuity mm -hmm. once I retire. So now it's going to be easier to focus on the presentation rather than uh, uh, locating my slides. Uh, Israel is somewhat unique in the sense that pension funds compete. I can choose my own pension providers. I can switch without losing tax benefits. If I don't like uh, the pension provider that now where my savings are being held, I can just pick up the phone and call someone else and I don't lose any tax benefits whatsoever. Generally speaking, there's no dependence on the employer. I can choose my own pension funds. Uh, fees are, roughly speaking, percentage of deposits and percentage of assets under management. There are some exceptions, but I won't get into that in detail. Now, since I did feel the urge to provide some graphs and some numbers, uh, this is from the Bank of Israel, uh, the public's uh, financial assets. Uh, look at the mutual funds on the right, and this is a comparison of 2004 versus 2014. This is the percentage of total financial assets held by the Israeli population. In terms of percentages, mutual funds have kept, you know, have stayed at the same level. If you compare now bank deposits and pension assets, you see that the percentage of assets under management in the pension sector has increased. Now the percentage numbers are somewhat misleading. This is how it looks in terms of actual shekels or billions of shekels. You can see that the pension sector is growing relatively rapidly and it's becoming more and more dominant within the Israeli financial market. So this is the background. Uh, let's talk about securitization in Israel. Now, in many places around the world, when you talk about securitization, you focus on the issues that EFI uh, is focused on, moral hazard in lending, maybe adverse selection. In Israel, somehow, when you look at the current discussion of securitization, it's all about, or it's mostly about distrust of the pension fund managers. And this is an example from the financial press. Without offending any of the other reporters here, this is what I found in English. This is how a newspaper describes securitization in Israel. We are going to take mortgages and sell them to the poor uh, uh, pension funds, and that's going to be the banks making money at the expense uh, of pensions. Now, you might think, well, this is only about... Just so you understand, the person who written this was just sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but again, it was just like I, I looked for an English, something in English that I don't have to translate myself. You know, making the graphs was difficult already. Um, but in fact, it's not only about securitization. If you look, you know, the regulation of institutional investors in the past several years in Israel, whenever there is a new financial product, or whenever there is a new, well, it's not a financial product, a new product enters the Israeli market, you get regulation that focuses on how institutional investors make those decisions. And I took part in all of those committees, and you know, it's not 50 shades of gray. It's about how justified or you know, for other reasons you may uh, find those types of regulation. Let's talk about the last one, the, the Goldschmidt Committee. You know, institution, pension funds making private loans to uh, uh, companies you get a government-sponsored committee that sits down and writes specific rules about how should pension funds uh, make these loans, how do should, should they make syndicated loans, you know, God forbid, what should happen when they buy loans from banks. And the question is, you know, if you don't trust the pension funds to make investment decisions, how, is it, you know, how can you justify and trust in them with, you know, running the pension for the Israeli public. You know, if they don't know to manage money, they don't know how to manage money. Now this is, this is kind of a provocative question and there's an easy answer to that question and, and that goes back to the defined contribution model that's part of the Israeli pension reform. There is a good uh, uh, part and there's a good and there's a bad part in the defined contribution model. The good part is that the savers, you know, the 
retirees of the futures of the future are the ones that bear investment risks. It's good, you know, it, it takes commitments away from the government budget. It's good for financial stability. You don't need to enter the thicket of capital adequacy requirement. You know, they're not leveraged. There are now solvency risks. The bad, the bad part about uh, the defined contribution model is that savers are those who, based, who, who face or bear the investment risk because that creates a huge incentive alignment problem. If I'm the pension fund manager and I know that my investment decisions are going to affect uh, you know, not my own uh, uh, bank account but you know, those whose money I run, how can I ensure that my incentives are aligned with those of, you know, for, whom the man, you know, for whom I manage the money? Now, this is to some extent, and, and you know, we know that based on studies from financial economy, you know, economics, the fee structure combined with competition can create you know, several types of distortions like herding and so on and so forth. This is another project I'm not going to talk about today. So we do need some form of government intervention to deal with the incentive alignment problem. But this does not explain why regulatory intervention you know, is selective. Now, this is my rough you know, distinction between areas where there's no investment or you know, product type regulation in, in cases where there are. Institutional investors are free to make their own investment decisions in shares, in real estate, in private equity and hedge funds. Nobody tries to sit down and write the rules of how should they make their investments. On the other hand, you know, there are relatively tight rules when it comes to corporate bonds, private and syndicated loans. The question is no longer true. There's a regulation on investment fees and hedge funds. No, on the cost side. Not, not how you should, you know, make this investment. Yeah, I know. But, but, I mean, there are many types of regulation, but not on, you know, we're going to tell you, we're going to educate you about how you should assess private equity investment funds. Wait, right. Um, and the question is, is there any logic, is there any logic to that distinction. Can we really make the case that you know, in those areas, that's where institutional investors need more help from the regulator or not? Think about securitization, for example. You know, people are concerned about uh, uh, institutional investors in Israel buying bad loans from Israeli banks. But if you look at the typical uh, uh, asset allocation and you can go online and, and look at each pension fund and see where it invests its money, they're really exposed to a large extent to Israeli banks through shares and through bonds that we know may be wiped out in the next crisis. So, you know, what's the difference between buying a bond from a bank or buying a securitized product? Needless to say that once you create these distinctions, you only encourage regulatory arbitrage, you create distortions because I'm going to, you know, buy investments where I'm less regulated. And the other question is why limit that only to the Israeli market? Now, there are several explanations out there. Uh, one is that, well, institutional investors are not sophisticated. They don't understand about securitization. They didn't understand about corporate bonds. I always find it unconvincing when somebody tries to convince me that an entity that's smart enough to charge me a lot of money for managing you know, my pension funds is not smart enough to buy any type of investment, so this is not convincing. The second argument is that, especially in the securitization context, well, banks in Israel are relatively strong, pension funds are relatively weak. Just, you know, I won't go back to the earlier slide, but look, about the, look on the numbers and you'll see who's the strong uh, party and who's the weak party, especially in, 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 in recent years. I think some of it has to do with the fact that I'm just going to mention here, it has been understudied, is that we are a small economy. Everyone, you know, all the institutional investors and all the large banks, you know, meet each other for lunch at the same neighborhood in Tel Aviv almost every day. That creates a lot of types of conflicts, uh, business-related conflicts. They may do business together, ownership-related conflicts. Uh, and, you know, I did find a way to, you know, cite one of uh, my papers, so I decided to cite a paper with Ishai, who's doing very little work today, just, you know, keeping time. Uh, in, in our study on how institutional investors in Israel vote and what conflicts affect uh, uh, their voting uh, behavior, we found that one 
of the conflicts that, that is really statistically significant in predicting institutional investors to vote pro or against management is the extent to which they themselves were owned by publicly traded uh, companies and that creates what we call their uh, structural conflicts. If I'm a fund manager uh, that I want to become an activist and I know that my own uh, boss is publicly traded itself, how can, be, how can I be active on you know, executive pay when I know that I may get fired for creating too much of a commotion in a small enough uh, market? But if that is the case, if that is the case, you know, there's no hope in trying to establishing a new committee whenever a new product enters the Israeli market. Uh, you know, no more committees for uh, 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 teaching pension funds or regulating their investment behavior. Instead, we need to be focusing more on incentive alignment. For example, rethinking uh, the fee structure uh, of pension funds, why not introduce some more pay for performance uh, compensation instead of just assets under management and percentage of assets under management. And we need to be focusing more on small economic concerns. Uh, to some extent, uh, this has been or will be achieved perhaps by the economic concentration legislation forcing some of the large companies to sell their uh, affiliated institutional or pension funds or institutional investors. And something that I'll just mention, and obviously I don't have the time to uh, talk about in more detail, think more closely about one policy instrument that is available for those who regulate pension funds, and that's quantitative restrictions. Uh, that was also mentioned to some extent and uh, uh, promoted in some extent in the concentration committee, try to think more about uh, how much can a pension fund in Israel invest in a specific Israeli company. I think there's much more to be done there and that would to some extent solve uh, uh, the concerns that may arise given the fact that we are a small economy better than try to regulate each type of new financial product that enters uh, 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 the Israeli market. And I did it on time. Yes, you did very well. Yeah, that's what happens when that's what happens when you ask lawyers to talk and you don't pay them by the hour. Thank you very much. It's all about incentives. Uh, the last speaker needs All right. Uh, now I'm standing between you and dinner, so. Um, Maybe a few questions when you're done. So I'm not standing between you and dinner. Yeah. Two, three, three quick points, and then I'll talk a little bit about, about securitization as I, as, as, as I see it from where I stand. One point relating to ASAFs about institutional investors. Uh, the uh, concentration committee, which I had uh, the privilege of being involved for about two years, and uh, essentially said, look, we have a, a very, very concentrated economy in each industry. It's a small economy, you know, it's not, not connected to practically anybody else. So we're like an island. So industries are concentrated. We're, on top of that, we have concentration that is across industries, which does not really need to be there. And so at the beginning, we said, look, we need to introduce some kind of policing devices so there's no tunneling and there's no all kinds of abuses in a variety of directions, all kinds of screwed up incentives that Sam was talking about. So we, the, the intermediate recommendations of the, of the committee were that let's take uh, institutional investors and, um, a, and make them policemen, which is what we like to do here. We, we sort of constantly allocate uh, policemen um, uh, within the economy so that we all sort of economically regulate each other or police each other. And so that actually blew up, blew up in our face because we, during the hearings, we talked to them and they said, and they said and convinced us that there's no way they want to do it. They have very poor incentives of doing it. And the second thing is that they can't do it because they have no expertise and no ability in terms of information to do it. So uh, it's, it's another way so that, that, that we, we should sort of lay off on, on, on putting too much stuff on that. And so we chose actually to separate, use very, very simple 
uh, rules. Let's say, you know, you two guys are together, there's no really economic reason for you to be together, so please split over the next six years. Uh, that was, uh, there was something that we made practically 180 degree um, term exactly identifying this, this problem. Uh, point that may, was made by EFI about rating agencies regulation, there was a question earlier. Uh, my teacher, uh, Lester Telser, Professor Lester Telser has had from University of Chicago had a, a very nice paper on self-enforcing uh, contracts. The contract, and, and so this is a classic case of self-enforcing contract. Why did it work for 150 years that companies, uh, rating agencies, absolutely voluntarily rated um, companies' debt, equity, all kinds of things, and it wo worked well, and actually it, it, it continues to work well in that area. Because it worked on the very simple assumption, for the same assumption when we, you go to a, uh, to a specialized agency that tests your used car that you want to buy, they don't want to uh, cheat on you on that deal because that'll kill their reputation for the rest of these transactions since they're charging you more than their marginal cost that creates a sufficient incentive not to cheat. That is what, how uh, underwriters work. This is how, um, this is how uh, rating agencies worked for many, many decades and worked well. But there's one condition for that, and the condition is that individual transaction is small relative to all the stream of digital transactions in the future. And that, that's why it worked. The minute, and Effie have showed it beautifully, that suddenly it's 30% of the market, and there are two, maybe three, guys that could do the rating. And there, by the way, one of the things that you didn't say is that there were two or three huge originators, Lehman and, and a couple of uh, monolines, that each of them could, could move 20, 30 percent of, uh, of your total annual income from one guy to another. That's what explains this handbook. This is what, so you need to just understand the economics of this, that it works very well on small transactions. Small doesn't have to be small, it could be $5 billion, it's still small relative to entire flow. But when you start moving 30% of my annual revenue, this is no longer, doesn't, uh, no longer works. Uh, I just want to comment on that if you don't mind. I think that this is an important point, but what I said is that it can explain only 5% of the market because that this only works if you can choose between, you know, having been regulated by one or by the other but about 95% of the market was re regulated by either two or by three. So it is true that you find that you have um, more, you're more likely to see inflated rating if you're only regulated by one because that you can gain it, but for the most part the market requires no, but this that you was be regulated not, by no, three. No, no, this, this is a different point. This is not how to uh, game the market on an individual transaction. Think about you are coming to an agency that, that evaluates used cars. Okay, you come with your car, the agency evaluates it correctly, or whatever, it, and then you go. Suppose now that the largest guy in, in, in Israel that sells used cars, which is a rental agency, says, look, I have 10,000 cars that I sell every year. So I'm going to bid between all of you, and so I'm going to choose the one who is going to be the most favorable model for doing it, not on individual cars. But, 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 but that's mm -hmm. under the assumption that you only need one rater. No, no, but even but they all three would have uh, good models for me. So that's that, that's, 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 that's the point. That's debatable. Uh, but but that's at least at least it, it's consistent with 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 this with this model of self-enforcing agreements. And the third thing relates to what uh, what uh, Sam and Amit said about uh, regulation inducing incentives. It's actually f hard to figure out what is the optimal uh, type of compensation schemes and what are the. What, are the, what is the best way to compensate bankers or investment bankers? We don't know that. Uh, it's hard, but it's actually much easier to figure out what kind of incentives a specific compensation provides. Okay, so let me give you an example. Suppose I'm in a flat salary. I have no reason to take any risks. On the other hand, suppose I have very little salary and huge bonus for annual earnings, okay? That means that I have a very strong incentive to take short-term risks. Now, the, I'm very much sympathetic to Sam's point is that let's raise capital requirements to more reasonable levels, but let's condition them on the compensation and risk-taking incentives that that institution provides to its 
to its uh, employees and to its management. If the incentives are very high risk taking, let's request higher uh, cushion, and if it's not, then request lower. Now to, to securitization. I actually view securitization from my, from my point of view in light of what Asaf showed us about the financial, the pension system and the, and the banking system. Three years ago, uh, when we wrote this, this report, they were roughly the same. Now, over the next uh, 10 years, after 2012, the banking system is growing at about 3% a year, maybe 2 to 4, somewhere in that vicinity. The pension system is growing between 8 and 11% a year. Okay, so starting at uh, roughly the same, they're going to become about 60 to 70% larger in 10 years. Okay, so pensions will become much bigger player in this industry. And so that implies a fifth reason to your four reasons of securitization because what that implies is uh, that there's be going to be a huge system. The economy is going to grow, but the banks will not grow with the rate of the economy. And so, but the banks have ability to work with everybody in the population. Large firms, small firms, government, individuals, everybody. The institutions don't have that ability. They buy bonds and stocks of traded large companies and they buy government debt, okay, at least within Israel. They sometimes invest in infrastructure, but again, these are big projects. So they are essentially not at all uh, financing the small and medium enterprises and they're not financing individuals. Now, so the money here comes with uh, capabilities or with expertise. It's not just money. So one money has uh, more expertise than the other money. So from the point of view of the government, but also from the point of view of the market, one pile of money has lower potential of investment in Israel. I mean, they can go outside. But in Israel, they have low potential uh, investment than, than the other pile of money. And so since that pile of money will, uh, is, is subject to very heavy regulation, industry-wide, uh, business group-wide, there's a variety, that creates a fifth demand which is how to take that pile of money and bring it to where this first pile, the banking pile of money, can no longer invest, but has the expertise to invest. Okay, so that is the, that is the reason that is not dependent on actual risk reduction. I mean, it could coexist with it, it could coexist with liquidity, coexist, but it's a separate reason. It's just limited the money without expertise and money with expertise. And so how do you actually pass this expertise? How do you connect this money to expertise? There are two ways. One way is securitization, is essentially letting banks do what they know how to do and then participating with that, so securitizing their, their loans and just transferring them to, to, the, to the institutional investors. By the way, those loans do not have to be necessarily liquid. I mean, they could be, you know, hold to maturity. The second thing is, which is, we, we're actually going the direction of, of United States in that respect, is creation of specialized intermediaries other than banks, which will compete with banks for access to uh, individual small and medium enterprises, et cetera, and they will be working solely for, for the, uh, uh, for the financial, financial uh, companies like pension funds, etc. That, by the way, given Israeli banking system, which is highly concentrated, the top three, just for our guests, top uh, two banks in Israel uh, control about uh, 60 to 65 percent, depending on, and the three control over 70. So uh, we need, they control also a lot of information about small and medium et enterprises as well as individuals, and therefore the credit scoring system, which developed voluntarily, in the United States because banks are small and therefore each bank would like to know about the world and so it gives up little information. Here, banks do not necessarily volunteer that, therefore we have to, and we are working right now, uh, creating credit scoring system to, to, to augment that development. Now if we talk about securitization history, at least from as far as I remember, it started on, on my watch with Zvika Eckstein's uh, passionate uh, drive to create uh, securitization 
in the RIAF committee in 2007 when we wanted to, to, to create much uh, more vibrant uh, uh, financial industry. I was, there was, I was doing it outside the government. And so the proposal is there, there but uh, there is a problem with regulation. I mean, uh, you know, you're worried about shadow banking. I'm more worried about shadow regulation in this country. Um, uh, the uh, regulators are sectorial, right? And so you have, in securitization, you have, you know, money and risks shifting from one part to another. And so each regulator wants to protect, you know, rightly and legitimately so, wants to protect the, the, the bodies that, that they are in charge of. So the banking regulator says, look, either you do the outright sale or I'm not going to consider that there's a sale and so this is not securitization. The institution, uh, the, the agency that protects institutions say, wait a minute, if you're going to outright sell, you're going to induce all these uh, weird incentives, so, you know, we want some kind of guarantees. And if you add tax authority and the antitrust authority and the, uh, and the security and exchange commissions of Israel, between the five of them, it's, it's quite difficult. And that's what uh, I think explains partially why we still don't have much securitization. Uh, but even if we do, suppose we sort of break into this uh, and, and we, 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 we create all the right conditions, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be uh, too um, optimistic about uh, sort of starting to, to securitize mortgages for two reasons. Uh, first of all, mortgages are about 22% of banking credit, so it's a large chunk, uh, maybe even more now. Um, uh, first of all, mortgage market in Israel is fairly competitive, so the profit margins are not that high, and so I mean you you can't really you can't I mean there's not a huge uh, benefit of of offloading it and creating pro, you know profitability, but it's still there. But um, like Effie said, uh, there's very limited amount of risk risk sharing, so it's not clear why would you why would you necessarily want to uh, offload them. The housing construction loans are another 20% of the, of, of the total banking portfolio. And so uh, there, uh, there's a lot of expertise required. And these are very short-term loans, so pension funds don't really, don't really want to hold them because these are three to four-year loans. And very, very highly, uh, you know, all, all kinds of things can go wrong. So these would be not the ones that probably got securitized. So we're already at about 45% of all the banking portfolio. Large firms, I don't know, maybe Hedva knows uh, better what is the large, large firm's portfolios in uh, this. This is, again, fairly competitive market. Uh, I'm not sure that securitization there is a problem, especially since, the, well, since there is no mm -hmm. problem there because, because financial institutions can access these guys. They compete with banks and they can access these guys directly. So I don't see why would they necessarily want to go through, through institutions. What is left? Uh, what is left is consumer credit and uh, the several areas that, that Effie pointed out and the small and medium enterprises. And there, I think uh, securitization could be an important part. It could be the part, that's where the fifth reason brings us to, that's where we would like to bring the, the, um, the, uh, this money without expertise, either through developing specialized uh, intermediaries or uh, or doing it with banks or both. And so securitization is important for the for last one. So I'm even though after six years, or actually, you know, we started in 2007, so it's eight years, we still haven't gotten to that. Uh, I think I can still be hopeful. Thank you. A few questions to, if you have energy to either the current panelists or the pre-break visitors? You're too exhausted, or anyone. <laughs> no? No? No questions? Ah, Bini, there is one question. Does anybody have answers? Only question. With respect to the credit rating agencies, if you recall, some of the stories were quite targeted Uh, it looks like they had a culture.
share um, cheating. And I'm curious if, if there's any room for this in your conclusion sort of uh, culture. So, um, Again, if you read my papers, you see that I've criticized the credit ratings uh, very much. But I think that once you subpoena a huge amount of emails and you cherry pick which ones to present, you can make a very convincing case. And I've been asked this question before, and I told them if, if someone would subpoena the emails that we sent each other about our students, uh, it, wouldn't look very, it, lo it wouldn't look very good. Um, I, there is no consistent and there is no persistent evidence from these emails. Someone has subpoenaed all of the emails that was, were sent by everyone who ever worked for Moody's and cherry-picked the five or six emails that were presented there. I'm not here to defend Moody's. I think that they have been mistaken, but if you ask me what is the biggest mistake of the rating agencies in the crisis, and I, I cannot put different weights on what caused the crisis because of, you know, I spent some time trying to run regressions, and I can explain very well the role that credit sh rating shopping explain in uh, the rating, but that would, uh, 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 that would hold for 5% of the market with an R square of 2%. But the main problem is, 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 is very simple. They had the wrong formula, and they compounded $11 trillion with the wrong formula. And one day they woke up and said, you know, gosh, we have to change the, the correlation structure. And on that day you had 35,000 uh, downgrades. We are looking for conspiracy theories, and that's human nature. But the explanation is much simpler. The formula was wrong. Maybe they had some wrong incentives. Maybe someone had, they could have had a better corporate governance. Maybe someone had to be involved. But eventually, there were 20 or 30 people in the world that knew what the formula was in Fitch, Moody's, and S&P. They made a mistake. It was a huge mistake for which you know, we paid a major cost. And we have many other conspiracy theories. And I think that for the most part, they cannot explain what we see or what we saw. Um, maybe you want to see that? I mean, the, the, the model had inputs, and the in, it's the, there was a formula, and there was some parameters that was fed into the model, and it was enough to change that parameter by five or six percent, and you would get something different. Again, I'm, I'm not saying here that the rating agencies didn't play a role, but you know, we would like to tell some stories that there was some deliberate, a deliberate uh, um, um, attempt to to cheat on everyone, and I don't think that that was the, the, the case. I think that there was a model that wasn't proof, and people were maybe optimistic, but I don't think that they were malicious. And, uh, and, and eventually, they were over-optimistic. Maybe a better governance structure would have avoided that. Maybe they should have, maybe Moody's and S&P should have, should have said that we should take some 50 additional experts, we should hire them, we should evaluate it externally. But the notion that the CEO of Moody's or S&P uh, sits there and he knows that today they have down, they, they have, that today they have uh, uh, um, um, deliberately uh, 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 um, produced inflated rating, rating for a uh, you know, couple of more billion dollars, I think that is a mistaken view. We, 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 most of us cannot understand, cannot, cannot digest the fact that people make mistakes, and some of these mistakes are honest mistakes with huge consequences. There, there, is, there is a lot of evidence, but when you look into, you know, what do you call evidence? A T statistic of two is evidence, but an R square of 1% says that this evidence is unique for very few securities. That's the problem. We cannot really explain the crisis. We cannot really explain the variation in the crisis with conspiracy-related uh, theories. Uh, yeah. even, I mean, though it's even though it's tempting. Even though it's tempting. I mean, uh, I mean the, the, the main issue is that you have 90, it's, uh, Always in economics, you can have 90, uh, you can have 90 uh, explanation that explains 3% of the variation, and you can have you know, one explanation that explains 90% of the, of the variation. 
and the one percent the one explanation that's twenty nine percent variation, they made a mistake. A silly mistake, but they made a mistake. Then we have 90 other explanations about conspiracy, all true. They explain 3% of the crisis, not more. I think anyway. I, I'll add one more thing here, which is uh, it's true that uh, you can look uh, at the data and find out that you could probably have detected it, but you've got to understand about the human capital inside waiting agencies as well. The human capital was always lagging behind all these smart investment banks. And uh, they will take time to understand these things, and that's why they do not do They could have bought the, the salaries because they had a lot of money. So what now we are talking about governments and other no. which is consistent. With Let's take issue. one last question, Dan Galai, and that will be the end. It's more a comment and question. It's concerning the rating agencies. You know, they had experience for 100 years in rating corporate bonds, and they did a pretty good job. They started rating structures only in the late 90s. <coughs> and especially the subprime, it started from the late 90s. Early two and the time series in Europe was a growing market, market expanding yeah. and very low volatility. And they didn't have much experience in using actually no equity <coughs> notes because the value of corporate bonds is judgmental. It's not based on notes. The structure are based on notes in which they have no experience and no, no prior knowledge. The investment banks knew much better how to price all the structures they move and SFP. So they use the wrong data, the wrong volatility, and very often the wrong models. Right. With one and they didn't have much experience. It was a very short time period. With one correction, you're, you're, you're pointing out that investment banks knew much better. I would disagree. I mean, the president of Lehman Brothers got divorced his settlement was in March 2008. I mean, he was, his wife was entitled to half of what he had. He took a giant loan against his shares and paid his wife in cash. <laughs> this was March 2008. Because this is president of Lehman Brothers. So say, arguing that they knew much better what's going to go in is probably uh, what we say. Okay, that, that was an excellent point. So it wasn't just a session about financial regulation, it was about life in general. <laughs> so thank you all for coming.